Our next presenter is Robert Kiley. Robert is the head of open research at the Wellcome Trust, where he is responsible for developing and implementing open research strategy. Most academic librarians would have heard of agreements with publishers that facilitate immediate open access publishing in renowned journals, which benefits both librarians and especially researchers. Robert will speak on this very contentious topic with a presentation entitled Open Access, COVID-19 and Plan S. He will be presenting virtually. Over to you, Robert. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, lovely, to, lovely to be here. Sorry I can't be with you <clears throat> in person. Obviously, things in the UK are still uh, reasonably difficult. Let me remind myself how to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can you can now see my screen. I'm assuming I can't hear howls of um, you can't, so you can. So thank you. So, so as 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 an introduce, I I head up the open research team at the Wellcome Trust. The so Wellcome is a is a research funder um, in the UK, a philanthropic funder. We fund primarily in the life sciences, but we also fund in the social science and humanities. And our new strategy actually is is slightly um, broader than that as well. Um, for the last six months, I've also been seconded to Coalition S. Uh, Coalition S is a, is a group of funders, a uh, group of research funders, which are committed to try and move the world uh, to, to a world where all research is available without paywalls and, and free to use. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, you know, open access in the light of, of, of COVID-19 and obviously reference that. Uh, Plan S. I think in some way this talk will complement um, the, the talk we heard on Tuesday from uh, from from Kanshu. From, uh, Kanshu. Uh, so it'll be there'll be some elements where which which are which are familiar. So what I'm going to try and do is is in the sort of 20 minutes or so is highlight the role of um, open access and open science more generally. When I talk about open access, I'm talking about access to sort of research articles, once we're open science, it's all the data, the protocols, the code, and so forth. Anyway, talk about the role openness has played in fighting uh, COVID-19. I discuss the issues which still persist around the sharing of, 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 of outputs in an open, um, open, sustainable way. I'm going to focus on open access, open access to publications, and I said discuss the role Plan S is is playing to reimagine how how research outputs could be shared and i hope i know there is a, a q a session uh, a little bit later this morning but if there's if there's time this morning after my presentation i'll be certainly be happy to take any any immediate questions i mean this is a a, a statement of the of the obvious uh, that covid has changed everything this is a a, a photograph you may be able to spot those of you who've been to the uk big ben in the background and the houses of parliament this is normally obviously a very, very, very busy part of, of the UK, right in the heart of central London. And as you can see, when, when the UK government eventually decided to introduce a lockdown, arguably um, a bit late in the day, but when they did, um, the impact was massive. And that impact, obviously, is from 18 months on, like in most places, the, the, it's changed over that time. And in the UK, things are gradually um, opening up. People are back in the, in the workplace. But obviously, it's still not. It's still the pandemic still persists. Um, in the UK, we have about thirty-five thousand new cases a day. It's, you know, it's a, it's a still a significant issue. Fortunately, the vaccines, which I'll come on to discuss, have meant that the number of fatalities um, are much much lower than at the the peak of the pandemic. But obviously, COVID has changed absolutely everything. The way we talk, the way we communicate, the way we share information. The fact I'm speaking to you from uh, my home in, in Guildford, which is about 30 miles southwest of, of London, COVID has changed absolutely the way we do everything. And it's fair to say that the importance of open access, open access to publications, was recognised right from the very start. And actually, the end of January 2020, which was exactly about a month after the um, the Chinese authorities had informed the WHO of this um, unusual um, uh, new form of, of virus. Um, the Wellcome Trust uh, published a statement calling on various actors in, in, the, in the research space, um, publishers, um, uh, researchers and others 
to make sure the outputs which they generate relating to COVID are available to all without any restrictions. We published that in, in January 2020. And folks can say on the publication part of it, over 50 publishers within about three weeks, uh, about 50 publishers, including all of the major publishers, Elsevier, Springer Nature, TNF, Wiley, you name them, CUP, OUP, all of them, um, signed a statement which said that any articles related to COVID would be made um, free of charge and actually free of charge, free to read in PubMed Central. And I spoke to my colleagues at PMC in, uh, the, at the, in the US, at the National Institutes of Health, and they shared some data with me earlier this year. And in one month alone, um, in April this year, these 150,000 articles or so were viewed more than 17 million times. So there's a, you know, each one of those articles was read an awful lot. So right from the get go, open access was recognized as a, will be a key part to tackling this uh, virus and the publishers uh, responded. We also saw researchers and their behavior changing. And perhaps the most significant change we witnessed was this, uh, the growth of preprints. Uh, preprints, as I'm sure you all know, is a place, is a server typically where an author can post a manuscript. They finish writing the manuscript. It's not a work in progress. It's a finished, completed manuscript, but has not yet been certified by peer review. And preprints have been going in the in the world of physics and the math and the mathematics for over 30 years. Um, Paul Ginsberg set up um, Archive, the physics repository, back in 1990. In the life sciences, we've been a little bit slow to catch on, and it was only really in about 2012, 2014, when the Colesprung Harbour Laboratory Press established um, BioArchive, a place for sharing our um, preprints relating to biology and related disciplines. And then much more recently in 2019, uh, MedArchive, which was a posting of preprints relating to medical and clinical uh, research. But you can see there's been an absolutely huge growth in the sharing of preprints. So getting information out there as, as quickly as possible so that others can um, access it, build upon it and not replicate it. So there's a key, key development from authors changing their behavior. And obviously underpinning all research is a data. And for many years, many of us have been calling for, for data sharing. And really, I think if you need a poster child for the benefits of, of, of data sharing, COVID-19 is that poster child. I mean, it's a, been an absolutely dreadful uh, pandemic. And as we know, there are many millions who have been killed by it and, and tens of millions affected. Um, but one small positive is that the benefits of data sharing became evident. And it was just six days so after the Chinese government actually alerted the WHO to this cause of pneumonia of unknown etiology detected in Wuhan, that the very first SARS-CoV-2 genome uh, was sequenced and published. And this screenshot on the right-hand side uh, shows, and you can clearly see it was submitted on the 5th of January, 2020. And the sharing of this sequence data has been absolutely critical. It, it helped inform uh, public health officials um, how they should best respond to this, um, this, new, this new virus at that point. It wasn't a pandemic, obviously, at that point, but how to respond to it. And critically, crucially, it gave researchers the, the starting point on how to develop tools to tackle that. And just this, this I, I looked at before I, I, I came online this morning, um, this, this sequence, this is in uh, a repository called, called GenBank. Um, this, asks, this, this particular sequence has been, has been cited uh, more than 1,800 times in research articles in the past um, 18 months or so. And it's played an absolutely key role in the development of, of probably all vaccines, the, the BioNTech vaccine explicitly referenced this early on. Um, but it's been absolutely critical for the development of vaccines. So, um, you know, it's great that sharing of, of um, this data has been so effective. And often we, we hear that one of the things you need, in addition to sort of researchers sharing stuff and, and so on, is you need infrastructure to make sure that data can be, can be accessed. And again, we saw lots of evidence, whether it's the European Commission, whether it's the, in the US, the, uh, the National Institute of Health working in partnership with uh, funders, the Allen Institute, for example, creating uh, uh, um, 
infrastructure to enable researchers to access all this data in one place and then run computational tools on them to do text and data mining, develop artificial intelligence tools to actually mine this, this, this pandemic of information, this epidemic of information, this huge amount of, of data which was published. So all good then. So we can get our, uh, put our metaphorical slippers on, put our feet up and get our cigars out. But of course, it's never quite that simple, is it? And um, we talked about a minute ago about the importance of sharing research data. But it's fair to say that in, where are we now? Middle of October, 2021, the sharing of research data is not the norm. It is not the default. And I'll just show you a few examples of this to sort of demonstrate this, this assertion with some, with some numbers. So in the UK, we um, at Wellcome Trust, we, we actually run a repository uh, called Europe PubMed Central. It's a mirror of the PubMed Central service in the, in the US. And we do that in partnership with about 30 other funders. Um, a search of that database shows that of all the COVID articles in there, and there are almost 280,000 of them, less than 10% of them actually have a data availability statement. So a statement which a data availability statement simply says like, if you want to get hold of this data, you go here. Or if you want to get hold of this data, contact me. Or says something, it ha makes it clear how a user could get to the data. 90% of articles about COVID don't have that. So that's a huge problem. It gets worse if that's possible. Even those which do have data availability statement, so you know, ah, at least I've got a clue on how I might get to this data. They include language like this is only available on request. And actually another study looking at these data availability statements talks about reasonableness. I don't know how anyone defines what, you know, they say you can reasonable request for access to this data will be, will be considered. I don't know what reasonable means in that, in that context. And on the right hand side, and I, and, I, and I share this with some sort of uh, mixed emotions. This article here, this, um, this article in the Lancet um, about the, the Chad Ox one um, is, the, is the, the fancy, is, the, is the, 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 the name of this study is of course what led to the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. This is the, re this is the research which showed the efficacy of that vaccine. And speaking of someone from the UK, where pretty much the whole UK has been vaccinated with this, with this vaccine. Um, again, even this really critical study, the proposed, if you want to get access to the data, well, the sponsor and the investigator will decide whether you are eligible. Uh, just not sure if that is really what we want in the 21st century. We want anyone to be able to access the data. I accept that with, with clinical data, there needs to be some safeguards. It can't just be dumped on the internet, but I think to, to put things behind uh, such a sort of restrictive access where the an individual can be denied, maybe for any good reason, I'm just not sure that's how we're really going to move things uh, forward. And there's this finally, there's another study in this, in this, in this space about clinical trial data. Now, there, as you may know, there is, there are now very specific guidelines from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, ICMJE, which talk about that they will only publish a clinical trial if it has a data availability statement. Um, so, so these now are being filled in, but you can say in a data availability statement, I'm not sharing. And that ticks the box to say there's a data availability statement, even if the language says not willing to share. And this, this study looked at um, all the trials listed in the clinicaltrials.gov repository, which is the place where you are required to, one of the places you're required to register that you're doing a trial on, on humans. So it's probably good, good practice that you define that you're doing this and you set out your outcome, your, your, what you're trying to measure before you start measuring it. Uh, nearly half of those trials registered in that repository so they're not willing to share the data. So I think there's significant work to be done to really shift, shift the mindset from, from one which is closed uh, to one which is open. And I'm going to take and just a minute or so on this particular example. So there's a repository, uh, GizAid, uh, which was set up um, after the um, one of the one of the flu on the flu crisis in the early two in the first, first bit of 2000. Uh, 
Anyway, the GSA initiative has now been expanded to not just uh, influenza viruses, but specifically um, the coronavirus. So it's been a very successful repository, and thousands and thousands of, uh, of, of people sequencing and putting their putting their sequences in this repository. But GSA, to protect the rights of researchers who have deposited these these sequences, um, only make the data available to registered users, who then agree to make use of under certain terms and conditions. And the, and the, and the argument used for this is that this encourages data deposition. And we heard on, 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 on Tuesday about this, this issue, particularly from researchers in, in perhaps the, um, not in the global north, and, and a fear that they're the ones collecting the data, and then it's the global north which then exploit that data, and then they develop um, drugs and vaccines which the developing world can't access. So it's a very, very strong argument, and a very powerful argument. But I think, and the reason I picked this out, because I think in, in, in the case of a pandemic, it really is in everyone's interest um, to try and share this information. And I think that, and this is now being recognised, and so there are there are calls from researchers, not all researchers, but calls from researchers, that the access rights and reuse rights on GizAid are just too restrictive. And there's been an open letter which was developed by researchers at the um, European Bioinformatics Institute trying to call for this data to be made more open and not put behind restrictive terms and conditions. At Welcome, we've tried to uh, address this. So I suppose we've tried to balance both sides. Um, what we say is that when you, if, if we give you funding, which leads to the development of, of COVID-19 um, sequences, then we require you to deposit those sequences in both the, the GizAid repository where restrictions can be applied and in the INSDC repositories, where obviously there are no act, no restrictions. So INSDC are the are the GenBank or the European Nucleotide Archive and so forth. And then if you deposit in one of these open repositories, welcome researchers, we say you can you can request that your data is embargoed for three months. So it'll be available immediately in GizAid with some restrictions. And then three months later, it'll be available to the world without any restrictions. So we're wondering, we hope that might um, appease sort of both both sides in the sense of, we want everyone to be able to use these data, but we recognize that there may be some concern that researchers want some time themselves to try and um, make use of these data. And then I want to talk about finally about public access and not open access. So it's great that the publishers, and I started off with a with applaud it, the publishers have made all this COVID literature uh, free to read, but it's not open access and we should not be fooled that is open access, it is read access. You can read it, but the right to reuse it is typically very restricted. And they typically, these articles, many of them come with all rights reserve licenses, which restrict that reuse. And further, some of these articles are sort of available for now, but at some point when the pandemic is deemed to be over, and in the case here, uh, Elsevier, when, when they decide they're not gonna run the COVID-19 resource center anymore, then these articles will be removed from a free to read and put back behind a paywall. So it's great they're open for now, but it is a, it is just like a for now uh, and it will change. So how do we solve this? Well, I think what we need to do is move to a world in which funders of research basically mandate that any research which comes out of their funding is made fully open access. And that simply means available at the time of publication without any any uh, paywall for the reader and, and available under a CC BY license, which allows unrestricted reuse, including commercial reuse. So if we fund a piece of research and um, GSK or, or, or Merck or whoever reuse that and make money out of it, that's fine. We want all the data, all the stuff we, we produce to be used for maximum societal benefit. So in short, what we're really trying to do is encourage all funders to align their open access policy with Plan S. So I'm gonna give you a very, very helicopter overview of Plan S and then I'm gonna stop. So Plan S is really built upon a series of, of strong principles. The, the key one really is that research results are a public good and should be available uh, to all. We want to accelerate science. And in some ways, again, COVID has, has demonstrated, if we, if, has demonstrated the importance of openness, if it's recognized that articles on COVID need to be made open, to help accelerate um, development of vaccines and therapies and so forth, 
well, why not articles on pli planet uh, on climate change? We're facing a climate emergency. What well, isn't that? Doesn't that count? Or or any other topic? If you're suffering from a rare form of cancer, that for you, that why why isn't that information open? So I think in some ways, the COVID nineteen has really let the genie out of the bottle. If we the importance of openness has been recognised. Well, it should apply across all disciplines. So, a key part of Plan S is that research outputs are basically a public good. I've already said that it should open access for us means immediately available, no embargo periods, and with an open license. Perhaps the most controversial part of Plan S, which has generated perhaps the most ink written on this topic, is around we no longer support the hybrid model of publication. This is where uh, a publisher has both subscription content and open access content for years. Funders like Welcome would fund the open access fee uh, in those hybrid journals with the sort of assumption and hope, and that's probably all it was, that in time those journals would transition from a subscription model to a open access model. That has not been borne out, so we've now uh, tried to accelerate the pace. We're saying that we won't fund hybrid except as part of a transitional arrangement with things like read and publish deals or subscribe to open or whatever. So there is a, net, a defined endpoint. So Plan S has got some uh, strong principles. Uh, we support multiple routes to compliance. There's a misapprehension that all we do is favor the gold route. Actually, we favor, we, we're in, in some ways um, agnostic about the route to open access. We just support on multiple routes, including publishing in fully open access journals, including uh, paying um, article processing fees in, in, in transformative arrangements like, like reading and publish deals and so forth. But we also support what, what, what uh, librarians often refer to as the, the green access route, where the author still publishes behind a, a paywall, but makes the accepted manuscript open access. Three routes to compliance to say Plan S is agnostic as to which route a particular, a particular author should follow, just has to follow one of them and ensure that the output from that funded research it's available, time of publication um, with a CCBY license. And I'm delighted to say we've got, um, I think I, I think I counted as well, I think there's 27 research funders on here and, and I was um, speaking to all you based in South Africa and I'm delighted that the, the South African Medical Research Council is one of our, is one of our funders and, and a key player in, in delivering um, this open access, this open access world. And obviously my last slide is, is, is really this, that we, we, we within Coalition S are working to encourage other funders to join join the coalition because I suppose in the end, and I'll read this, and read this, read this line out, uh, by, yeah, read, this, read this out, it really is only by funders working together in partnership with institutions and researchers that we will change scholarly communication system, make it fit for the 21st century. I've been talking about open access um, at Welcome, we developed our first open access policy in 2005. Uh, I've been I've been at Welcome all those years, and I've been sort of leading this work for for most of that most of that time. And it, it's you know it, 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 why have we been talking about this for for almost 20 years? It really is time to bring about a change. I think Coalition S and Plan S can do that. So I urge you, wherever you are listening or watching or participating, um, to encourage your research funders in your locality to consider. Um, looking at the Plan S principles and developing a policy which aligns with those principles. Thank you very much for your time and if there is time for your questions now I'll be happy to answer any. Thank you.